The AK Party regains its parliamentary majority after Sunday's general election in Turkey. But will the ambitions of President Rajab Tayyip Erdogan for an executive presidential system be frustrated? And how will he consolidate power? With many difficult issues both at home and abroad, can the AK Party cope? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Turkey's ruling AK Party has regained its big parliamentary majority. In June, the party lost that majority for the first time in 13 years. Attempts to form a coalition government with other parties failed and Sunday's snap election was called. Added to the atmosphere of political uncertainty has been the fear of violence. In the period between June and now, Turks have been subjected to a series of bombings in which many died. The attacks have been blamed on ISIL. It was in this climate that Turks went to vote for the second time in less than six months. And as Jamal El Shayal reports from Ankara, they backed the ruling party in huge numbers. The man of the hour, Ahmed Davidoglu, addresses jubilant supporters in the capital, Ankara. Today is a day of victory for our democracy, for our nation. And may God be content with everyone who has made this victory possible. Going into the elections, the AK Party was hoping to regain the majority it had lost last June. But even the most optimistic exit polls didn't predict such a resounding victory. Turnout was close to 90%. I'm very happy with the results, obviously. And I'm happy that a lot of citizens actually went to the polls today and showed that they, uh, they in fact, do want unity over polarization. They want a continuous democracy. Now that the AK Party has gained uh, the majority, we will look to unite and embrace uh, all the uh, parties, all the other parties. Turkey's opposition parties were quick to concede defeat. We respect the outcome of the elections of the 1st of November in the same way as we have respected the election results of the 7th of June. And I do not want anyone to have any concerns. The pro-Kurdish HDP survived the scare, barely getting enough votes to get into parliament. Its leader, though, was critical of the election process. With regret, I have to say that there wasn't a fair and equal election. We received approximately 11% of the votes without waging a political campaign in the middle of a bloody doomsday. HDB didn't hold a campaign. It couldn't. We only tried to protect our people against massacres. So it is a victory that surpassed all expectations. But despite this huge win, the AK Party and its leadership still face several challenges, including a stuttering economy, increased violence and insecurity, not to mention trying to bridge the divide in what is a polarized society. But now the AK Party's leadership and Prime Minister Ahmed Rudoglu can face these challenges with a renewed mandate. Jamal Al Chayyan, Al Jazeera, Ankara. Well, the Turkish president says Sunday's win is proof that voters believe the AK Party is the only one capable of maintaining security. The national will manifested itself on November the 1st in favor of stability. After the short-term developments, the national will decided that there is no way out other than choosing stability. They decided in favor of stability. I hope this outcome will be good for our people and our country. Well, Sunday's win has put President Rajab Tayyip Erdogan in a stronger position to pursue his ambitions of assuming greater powers. But the AK Party lacks the supermajority. He would need to expand his powers into a US-style executive president. To change the constitution, he'll now need to go to the people by calling a referendum. Mr. Erdogan's critics accuse him of wanting to change the secular nature of Turkish society into a religious one governed by Islamic principles and of silencing his rivals and dissenting voices in the media. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our guests. In Istanbul, we have Ravza Gavadji, Member of Parliament from the first region of Istanbul for the AK Party. In London, we have Ega Sajkin. He's the Turkey specialist for IHS 
country risk. And in Ankara, via Skype, we have Suat Kinikliuglu, who is Executive Director of the Centre for Strategic Communication. Welcome to you all. But can I start with you first, uh, Ravza, in Istanbul. What is your party, what is the AK party preparing to do with this regained majority? Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. AK party is ready for Turkey to go for forward. As you know, over the last 13 years, Turkey has gone a great democratization process. And uh, we are able to say that on many, many issues that we couldn't even discuss previously, now we're able to take action and we have more freedoms than we had before the AK Party government was in office what do you in mean? 2001. What, what sort of freedoms? Uh, Turkey what has sort been of freedoms? Growing. Sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt you, but can I get you to be oh. a little bit more specific? All right. What kind As of freedoms do you enjoy now hmm. that you didn't have before AK? In many different areas there are we can discuss, but I can tell you about a personal freedom that I have gained as a person, as a woman who wears a headscarf. Uh, as you know, in Turkey, unfortunately, we had a headscarf ban uh, for many, many years, and uh, especially in stated in universities and uh, official, um, official organizations or state organizations uh, after the 1980 military coup. And uh, this is something that changed, that AK Party changed. And uh, lifting the headscarf ban is one of them. And I'm a very good example, because uh, now, as a parliamentarian, female parliamentarian from Istanbul who wears the headscarf, I'm able to serve my country as I took my oath on 7th of June in the previous elections, got elected and took my oath uh, in front in the Turkish parliament. This is just one of the freedoms. Okay, in let's, addition let, to that, let, let's just leave it, let's just leave it. About, uh, sorry, yes. let's just leave it at that one freedom. That's a very good example. Thank you. Let's go to Suat with that and suggest that uh, the AK party is good news. Uh, the atmosphere of, of fear, of violence and of political uncertainty has all worked in the favour, hasn't it, of AK party and of course President Erdogan. Well, indeed it has. Since uh, June 20 this year, the resumption of violence between the PKK and the security forces, uh, the horrendous bombings in Diyarbakir, in Suruç, and also in Ankara, has securitized the uh, election environment. And, uh, and uh, as a result of that, I think many uh, Turkish voters uh, decided uh, that uh, in, in this securitized environment, uh, that they switch their votes, mainly from the MHP and to some extent from the HDP to the ruling party. And so what's your problem then with the AK party uh, significant, uh, regaining its significant majority? Because I know that you have written uh, quite a lot, haven't you, criticising the government of, uh, of AK and of course President Erdogan himself. Well, uh, you know, the, the will of the people has, has spoken. There is nothing we can say about that. It's, it's, it was a democratic election. It was not under free and fair conditions, but still the will of the people has uh, been reflected on the result. What I'm critical about is the pressure on the media, uh, freedom of expression, freedom uh, of assembly, uh, and unfortunately the increasing authoritarian tendencies we have seen uh, by President Erdogan. With this election result, I'm afraid uh, the, the polarization and the, uh, the sense of helplessness on uh, at least half of our society is likely to continue. So therefore, I hope that the government and President Erdogan will choose to be more compromising and recognizing that uh, Turkey is a very diverse country and compromise is one of the main um, uh, values in a normal democracy. And Ega in, in London, um, what do you make then of uh, the majority, the new majority for the party and the impetus that that presumably gives to President Erdogan's ambition uh, for an extended presidential system whereby he does have more power? Well, we have already heard uh, in the immediate at aftermath uh, of the election um, indications uh, that um, we may see a renewed bid uh, for, for the constitutional changes that would bring about this uh, executive presidential system that you have been referring to. Um, this will all depend on uh, the um, calculation 
uh, of President Erdogan uh, with regards to how um, possible uh, it would be uh, in the current environment to, to go ahead with these plans. I think uh, a key point to emphasize here is that prior to the June 7 election, so the first election in 2015, um, there was a big emphasis on behalf of the AKP uh, on the presidential system as one of the election uh, pledges. Uh, in the aftermath of that election, uh, this was completely uh, removed from the table uh, with the AKP instead uh, focusing on uh, the, the issue of security, uh, the issue of uh, you know, resuming the fight against the PKK. Uh, it, it, the question is whether the government will see this as an indication that even its own core voter base has to a great extent rejected the uh, presidential system idea, uh, and this was the reason why the AKP uh, in the election we saw on Sunday uh, achieved such a, such a massive success compared okay. to June. Okay, all right. Well, let, well, let's put that then to Ravza in Istanbul. Uh, what do you perceive to be, as an AK Party uh, parliamentarian, what do you perceive to be the president's ambitions now? How divisive an issue is this purported uh, desire for more power in the presidential uh, hands? And do AK Party members generally support uh, what we think to be uh, President Erdogan's ambition? All right. Uh, actually, we need to make a couple of corrections. First of all, this wasn't an election where President Erdogan was a part of the elections. As you know, this was an election, general elections for AK Party, and the leader of AK Party is our Prime Minister, uh, Professor Ahmet Davutoglu. So we need to make a clarification. President Erdogan is the president of Turkish Republic. He got elected with 51, 52% of the votes, with the popular vote of the Turkish people. So we need to separate that. This wasn't like an election no, where I, President absolutely. Erdogan was I think running, we I think we understand that. But, party was but the, override, yes. the overriding yeah. impression is yeah. that uh, any vote taking place in Turkey today is a vote with regard to the, the, the man who overshadows the political system in your country, which of course is the president, although we can talk about the position of Mr. Davutoglu in, in just a little while. Uh, President Erdogan is not the, uh, the presidency, the issue of having a presidential system is completely separate from the persona of Erdogan. This is something that uh, AK Party brought to the table for different parties to discuss and that's something that's still on the agenda. However, there is something more urgent for Turkey right now. That's the current constitution. Unfortunately, I'm embarrassed to say that Turkey is still being run by the post-1980 military coup constitution. This is still not a civilian constitution. Uh, before the elections of 7th of June, uh, there was a committee formed by, with the leadership of AK Party and with Prime Minister Davutoglu, and there was a committee formed within the parliament for a uh, for, to work on a new constitution, but unfortunately the other parties did not want to take full part and full responsibility in the work of this committee. That's why we were unable to come up with a new constitution. The constitution, the changing of the current constitution is more of a priority and uh, looking at the structure, the current structure of the Turkish system, we see that the parliamentary system as is doesn't fit the regular, the, the current Turkey, which is growing and changing. And Suat, in Ankara, what's your reading then of the current constitution? Do you think that it is, it's out of date, it's out of touch with modern day Turkey and therefore needs replacing? Yeah, indeed, it needs to be replaced. Uh, we need a new constitution, but I think uh, Mrs. Kavakcı has a bad memory. The reason why the constitutional committee's work didn't uh, bore fruit was because the insistence by the AKP to have a, uh, have a presidential system involved in it. Uh, in many, uh, many clauses of the Constitution have been agreed upon. There were a number that, uh, where there was no consensus, but the primary reason why the Constitutional Committee could not conclude its work was the insistence uh, 
uh, on the uh, executive presidency. So, but no doubt, regardless of presidency or not, uh, Turkey needs to have a new constitution that reflects uh, a civilian um, spirit uh, and has the the state, uh, be, you know, defined as a servant of the citizen. However. One, need, one does need to be realistic. I mean, we cannot overlook um, the, uh, the shadow that uh, Pro President Erdogan has over both the party and the, the work on the Constitution, which basically um, uh, dictates a more um, conservative uh, and, in many respects, more limited uh, understanding of how pluralism should work in a uh, normal democracy. OK, and very quick, very I quickly. I interrupt. Oh, please, that, please do. I'm sorry. I mean, that, uh, first of all, me having a bad mem memory, I will, I will not uh, pretend I did not hear that. But uh, President Erdogan, of course, is the president, and he's the one who started the AK Party movement and got the support of the people. But changing of the constitution into something that's more uh, authoritarian, that just, uh, that's not something that is possible. Changing of constitution is something that needs to be done in the Turkish parliament with the involvement of all parties. That is what AK Party wants. But it seems like as a relatively new member of the parliament from the short uh, term that I had since 23rd of June till, the, till yesterday when we had the elections, uh, what I saw unfortunately is there is this uh, understanding whatever AK Party does uh, it seems like the other parties do not want to be a part of it just because it's AK Party doing it, whether if it's for the good or the society or not. So this is not something that deals with President Erdogan. I lived through the 1980 right. military Sorry, coup. I okay, I remember okay, what it I think, was like in the streets. I, th so I think we, we need, need to, to change this against. We need. To, I think we need to leave this uh, constitutional debate now and look slightly further afield. And Edgar, can I come to you in London and just ask how security? Uh, has featured in the whole electoral process this year. Turks, of course, have had to vote twice in one year, which uh, is uh, is rather a lot, isn't it? But the but the issue of security must be uppermost in so many people's minds. Of course, I mean the change uh, we saw right after the election in terms of the 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 immediate resumption of uh, the fight with the PKK uh, had a major impact on the voting behaviour. Uh, of the electorate. So on the one hand, uh, w there was a significant group of people who had voted for the, the pro-Kurdish party, the HDP, uh, with a view to making sure that party entered parliament uh, by passing the 10% threshold uh, and thereby uh, curtailing the potential uh, ability of the AKP uh, of uh, reaching a, 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 a supermajority, perhaps at the rate of uh, 330, which would allow uh, the AKP to have a, a dominant position in the parliament. A lot of these people uh, who were, uh, to an extent, you know, um, ordinary, ordinary uh, citizens who, who, who did not have any affiliation with the HDP in terms of Kurdish nationalism, um, shifted their preference back towards, for example, the CHP uh, because of the increased securitization uh, of the voting environment. On top of this, we also saw uh, a shift amongst uh, conservative Kurds uh, who uh, s saw that the HDP has been unable or one might argue unwilling to dissociate itself with the PKK. Okay. Uh, and all therefore right, we saw right. a, a shift of votes from the, from the HDP to the AKP for that thank, reason. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can I go now uh, to Suat and ask whether this, this uh, new majority for the AK Party, how that will impact upon, for instance, its handling of the refugee crisis. As we know, around two million Syrian refugees are currently being housed by, uh, by Turkey and it's been the subject of, of, of talks with the European Union. How will this impact the situation regarding Syrian refugees? I think, uh, you know, once the Turkish government is formed, uh, there will be a resumption of negotiations with the European Union. Um, I expect that uh, some financial assistance will be made to Turkey in exchange uh, for Turkey controlling its borders more strictly so that lesser um, uh, refugees make it into Europe. 
but uh, I, I don't foresee any changes, uh, you know, had it not been a, a majority as it is now, I don't think there would be any major changes. So uh, the Europeans were waiting for the Turkish election to be over. Now it's done. And once the, gov uh, the government is formed, I think the two sides will negotiate of a workable um, uh, formula for the refugees uh, in Turkey. And Ravza, um, what about the issue of the PKK? Will a majority now for the AK Party, will that help stimulate, revive uh, a peace process of sorts with the PKK? Yes, thank you. We first of all need to clarify how the peace process came to an end. During the peace process, there were a number of attacks, violent attacks by the PKK, and there were some security forces, some members of the security forces who were killed. But after the elections, together with the elections, violence against increased, and PKK terror started to take more lives, more civilian lives in Turkey. You've also, uh, this you've is also had ISIL, Turkey has been dealing you? with for decades. You've also had the introduction of ISIL attacks yes, on Turkish exactly, soil. Exactly, that's what I was going to say. Yes. Unfortunately, ISIL, and thank you for telling, reminding me because that's what I was just about to say. So ISIL and PKK are both terrorist organizations that Turkey will continue to fight to make sure we can maintain security in our soil and in the area. But one of the things that we also need, need to do, something that kind of fueled ISIL, in my opinion, is we need to make sure that we have peace in Syria and that no more people are killed. That will bring, bring a solution to the uh, refugee problem and the terrorism problem, because in unstable areas, you know that terrorism unfortunately increases. Okay. And we are, uh, we are sad uh, that we're, we have lost so many lives to both terrorist, right. mm -hmm. uh, Edgar, Edgar, terrorist in, groups. In London, um, I'm particularly interested in the uh, rather boosted position, perhaps, of the Prime Minister now, Ahmed Davutoglu, who has now proved himself uh, on the uh, political stage, in the political arena. How does that place him now with regard to a president who wants to take more power for himself? Will he be happy with that? Will he be content? Uh, Davutoglu, um, until now, um, he, he has been definitely very successful uh, in terms of uh, reviving uh, the AKP in terms of uh, bringing uh, the AKP back to a successful uh, posture. Uh, but the question is whether or not uh, he will be able to uh, establish uh, his own voice uh, independently from that of Erdogan and, and go ahead with the, with, with the necessary policies uh, that Turkey needs at this point in time, particularly with uh, regard to uh, the structural economic problems that the country has, which will require painful reforms, um, and whether or not Dautolu will be able to pursue these uh, changes, um, not only uh, against the wishes of Erdogan, but uh, against the wishes of um, a, an increasing proportion of, of the AKP's uh, leadership uh, that is... Uh, that looks to be uh, more closely affiliated with, with, with a different school of thought uh, with, right. uh, that are characterized uh, increasingly with uh, more loyalty uh, right. to President Erdogan as opposed to uh, the Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Suat. Uh, Suat, we have 30 seconds. I wonder if you could come up with the first thing that the new government needs to do with regard to the polarization in the country, given that, what, 50 percent of the country didn't vote for AK Party? Well, we, you know, the Prime Minister Davutoglu's balcony speech was great. The content was very encouraging and constructive. All we need is that he follows up and uh, um, uh, does what he says. And hopefully he will be able to do that uh, despite Mr. Erdogan. OK, thank you very much. Thank you all very much indeed. Suat Kini Klioglu in Ankara. Ega Sachkin in London. And Ravza Kavaji in Istanbul. Thank you all very much indeed for joining this uh, interesting conversation. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can leave your comments on the programmes page of our website, aljazeera.com. You can post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or... 
as always, the Twitter sphere. Tweet us at AJ Inside Story. Thank you for watching. From me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team. It's bye for now. <laughs>